we have finally made it to the last habitat of our zoo. And the mirror has been moved. So if you think the character that is swinging on the front of the pulpit that replaced the mirror looks like you, that is another sermon for another day. But the mirror has been moved, but I want you to notice I used the word moved and not gone. They, they tell you in the preacher books that when you decide you're going to do a long sermon series, you better have one fantastic sermon at the end of it to anchor it all together. And well, just so you know, this is one of those sermon series where the last came first and the first came last because this is actually the first one that got written. So all the other sermons that we've done to this point in the zoo actually came off of this one. So this one pulls everything together. And hopefully each of you, as you came in this morning, were handed a very small mirror. If you got a bulletin, which we tried to make sure everybody got one, there is a little small mirror, and there is a point. Because for 12 weeks, there has been a great big mirror that has hung from this pulpit that we have asked you to look in every single week. And now I want to change your focus, because that mirror, it was here. And let's be very honest, it is very easy for me to be a Christian and to be the image of Christ here. I mean, I only come here one day a week usually. Okay, I'm here more often than that, but normally it's it's a one day. And even that isn't a whole day, right? I mean, I only have to pull it together for around two hours, right? And then it's all okay. I can look in the mirror and say, but the little two-inch mirror that you've been handed... That one can go with you everywhere. That one was designed to be portable. That one is so you can check your image as you go to work. That one is so you can check your image as you live your life. That one is so you can check your image as you're out in the park. That one is so you can check your image when you're at home. That one goes everywhere you go. And so that is a gift to you as a reminder that, you know what, this sermon was all about taking a look at ourselves. And so now I have given you a constant reminder that honestly can go anywhere you can go. And well, I just want to kind of give you a quick recap because also gone from the wall today is that wonderful zoo map that we had up. And we don't need the map anymore because this is not about where we're going. This is about where we've been and we have now caged up 11 animals. And um, each of these animals stood for a spiritual issue that all of us are dealing with or have dealt with or will deal with. And we started off with the hyena and we talked about divisiveness. And then we moved over to the to the wolf in sheep's clothing and we talked about authenticity. And then we moved over to the to the poisonous snake and we talked about venomous speech. And then we moved over to the lion and we talked about being disconnected from the Bible, I mean from the body. And then we moved over to the camel and we talked about legalism. And then we moved over to the bear and yeah, I'm cheating off the thing up there. We moved over to the bear and we, we, we talked about a responsibility and then we moved over to the elephant and we talked about unforgiveness and we moved to the eagle and we talked about the abuse of liberty. We moved over to the bat and we talked about vision and we moved over to the chameleon and we talked about we talked about the worldly mindset and last week you know what I think was a very fun sermon minus the balloons this week um, we talked about the frog and what it means to be puffed up with our own selves or that idea of pride and we put all of these things in the cage and you notice the cage moved today and I made sure I repositioned every animal because guess what now they're watching you Because we've got them all in the cage now, and the hope is is that in going through this series, you've identified maybe some of these things in your life that you struggle with, and you haven't necessarily tried to cage them up, but we're trying to deal with them. Every single sermon has gotten a kind of a help at the end of it of how do I apply this sermon? How do I take it out into my life? And hopefully what's happening is we're seeing less of these issues, and we're seeing more of Christ. But you know what? There's one more animal missing from the cage. I mean, he has to go in here, right? The little monkey just has to fit. And you notice I saved the spot for him. Right at the very corner of the cage. And well, let me just tell you about monkeys. Monkeys or baboons or apes, however you, they want to translate the word, the word, are mentioned only twice in the Bible. And they're mentioned in Kings and Chronicles. And they're mentioned there because in, because in both of those passages, these were exotic animals that were imports. And so they were kind of status symbols. I mean, 
you had to be rich to have a monkey. All right? I mean, monkeys were those, those pets that, that everybody, if you had one, you were usually a king or, you know, you had lots of money or you were, they were imported. And that's probably why you don't see the word used very much in, in the Bible because um, most monkeys were, were imported into the area that they were coming in. In the wild, the smallest monkey in the world is the pygmy marmoset monkey with a body of only about five inches long. Oh, what a cute little monkey. He'd make a cool pet but not at my house. While monkeys and apes are similar, they are very different from each other. Monkeys have tails, and they have snouts, and they are not as, intelli- less, they are not as intelligent as apes. The spider monkey is the most acrobatic monkey and has been known to leap across gaps as large as 35 feet. That's impressive. I'm lucky if I can jump six inches. I mean, 35 feet. Monkeys are found almost, almost everywhere on Earth except for Australia and Antarctica. Smart monkeys don't want to live where it's cold. A group of monkeys, we can't decide what to call them. Maybe we should call them church. I don't know. But a group of monkeys are called either a, ch- a troop, a barrel, a carload, a cartload, or sometimes a tribe. But you know what's the most interesting little fun fact about monkeys? We called this sermon title was The Monkey Cage and not The Monkeys, and this has been worrying my son for like weeks because all the other sermons were about an animal and this was about the cage. The monkey is the only species that we could actually put all the various kind of monkeys into the same cage at the zoo and they would divide themselves up and they would be able to live peacefully with each other. Maybe we could take a lesson from the monkeys. I mean, because they, by the way, I resisted using the song, Hey, Hey, We're the Monkeys. I, I had that and pulled it, thought it would be a little too, but I, but I thought about that. But, but maybe the idea that the monkeys have figured out something that we can't seem to do, how to live at peace in a confined habitat. Now, they don't do it in the zoo because then you'd have to sit there and try to pick the different monkeys out. So they actually do section them off in the zoo. But monkeys are designed to live together. And I had a lot of different places I could go with this sermon. Like I said, we had the hey, hey, and the monkeys. I could have done the Planet of Apes. I thought about Curious George. I thought about a lot of different takes off of this sermon, and I finally landed right here. Um, I'm sure you know what this is. You might even have one of these little statues sitting somewhere in your house. It is a little statue that has three monkeys on it, and the monkeys are hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil. It's a popular little statue, and um, here's something that you didn't know. Did you know it was based off of a Chinese proverb? Here's something I bet you probably didn't know. Did you know the monkeys have names? The monkeys actually have names. The one that can't hear, his name is Mizuru. And the one that can't see, his name is Kikazuru. And the one that can't speak, well, his name is Iwarazu. And I had to like, look, look these up and practice. I still never had to pronounce them right. But these monkeys had names because they're part of a story. And here's something that maybe you still didn't know. Did you know in the original proverb, there were four monkeys? The original statue wasn't three monkeys. It was four monkeys. It was hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil. And then we had Shirazu, who stood for do no evil. And, well, he was a little monkey that was pictured with his hands folded in his lap. And isn't it funny that when we brought this into America, you know evil was left off. And the reason is because in the Americanized version of this particular statue, the statue means something different to us than the Proverbs. Usually we think, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, is what we say for not getting involved. If I don't hear it, and I don't see it, and I don't speak it, then it's not my concern, and I can go on with my life, and I can just move on. And, and so we change the meaning, but when you add in this fourth little monkey, do no evil, the meaning of the story changes to what was the original Chinese proverb, and that is how to avoid evil. Now, I want you to notice something about the fourth monkey, this picture there at the top. He can definitely see everything that's going on around him. He can definitely hear everything that's going on around him. He can definitely talk about everything that's going on around him. But he's important because he's made the choice that even though he can see it, hear it, talk about it, I'm going to avoid it. I'm 
not going to participate. And this is a great lesson for us because in the church we kind of have the hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil mentality, and that we want to avoid evil by building a hedge around ourselves and being who we are here, where the mirror is stationary, where I don't have to worry about the rest of the world because I can just put on my nice little clothes of Christianity and come in here and stand in front of the mirror and all is okay. But you know what? This gets much more complicated when we talk about the two-inch mirror going out into the world and living a Christian life and still being different. So this morning we're going to talk about the importance of avoiding evil. This is a topic that's discussed a lot in the Bible. We're going to start off in Isaiah. By the way, you can go ahead and start. If you copy of God's Word, you can make your way to Isaiah 3. I'll catch up with you in just a minute. But we're going to start off in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who, are call, who call evil good and good evil, who put on darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And the key word there is woe. And that's not a horsey woe. That's a woe, warning. If you can't tell the difference between good and evil, then you're going to have a problem in your life. King Solomon kicks in a little information on this. He says, The highway of the upright avoids evil. Those who guard their way preserve their life. And so this is important to us because if I am going to have a life that honors God, if I'm going to be upright, if I'm going to walk like God intended me to walk, then I'm going to have to figure out how to deal with evil because it ain't going away. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 19 through 22 says, Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And so there is this idea that when I allow evil to come into my life and I allow evil to, to control me and I participate in evil, that I quench the spirit. Sometimes I wonder if we've participated so much that we have like the rain that's been in our front yard drenched the spirit. And we look at this, and so, so now I understand the importance because if I really want to have a relationship with God, then I've got to deal with this idea of evil. And so that brings us to, well, applying the monkeys. How do I go about doing this? How do I avoid evil? Because that's what I really want to know. And this entire verse is really about how to live a godly life in an ungodly environment. Now, tell me that is not something that we Christians need to hear today. How do I, Barry, or your name, or whoever you see in the mirror, how do I do it? How do I go about living my godly Christian life in a world that honestly is about as ungodly as it gets? Well, let's see what Isaiah has to say to us. Isaiah chapter 3, verses 14 through 16 says, The sinners in Zion are terrified, trembling, gri trembling grips the godless. Who of us can dwell in the consuming fire? Who of us can dwell with the everlasting burning? Those who walk righteously and speak what is right, who reject gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes, who stop their ears up against plots of murder and shut their eyes against con con contemplating evil. They are the ones who will dwell in the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. Their bread will be supplied and water will not them. So this is an important verse for us because I wanted you to right off the bat see Isaiah identifies this target. Who is this message written to? Sinners. Evil do. But even more than that, he says, sinners in Zion, and if you know who the people in Zion are, those were the Israelites. Those was all, that was always a reference to the Israelite nation. So he's talking about God's people struggling with sin. All right? I can fit that category easily. Most days of the week, okay, every day of the week, maybe every minute of the day, I don't know. But I can fit the category. I am a person that desires to be a God follower that struggles with sin. So this is applicable to my life. And Isaiah begins, as most good sermons begin, I mean, they want to pique your interest to see if you, if you can identify. So he asked two very good questions. Who of us can dwell in the, with the consuming fire? Now, I want you to notice it says in, and it says with and not in. So that changes the meaning of what this question is. And then the second question is, is who of us can dwell with everlasting burning? 
And, well, this is not talking about who of us can deal with hell. It's talking about who of us can deal with living at peace in the presence of God. I mean, who is it that can do that? And maybe now we want to say, well, this is talking about who of us can live in heaven. I, I want you to step back from it, or maybe even get in closer. Because you need to understand that the moment you accept Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, then the Holy Spirit takes up residence with you. And He becomes part of your life like that little two-inch mirror. He goes everywhere you go. He sees everything you see. He hears everything you hear. He is subject to listening to everything you say. And He is a witness to everything that you do. And maybe you've never quite thought about Christianity about like that. But that's the way it works. See, God's not interested in just getting us to heaven. God wants us to know how to live our life in a way that we can live in a relationship with Him. And the key word here is at peace. Am I at peace in my relationship with God? Because sometimes my relationship is more like that. It really, really, really does. So I have some good news for you. Isaiah had a really good outline, and I stole it. Um, Isaiah definitely answers the question, who can live in the presence of God at peace? And well, you just might not like the answer. Because you know what? He begins with those that speak no evil. What does the verse say? Those who walk righteously and speak what is right. Now I do understand we've already been over in the snake pit, man. We spent a whole week and we just pounded the idea of what it means to have vicious speech. But now Isaiah is talk, taking the other thing. Do you have speech that is right? Is your speech righteous? <clears throat> Interesting, he starts with what comes out of our mouth. Of course, we've already been by the snake pit, and we know why. Because what comes out of my mouth is exactly what's inside me. What comes out of my mouth is exactly what is dwelling in me, and is just waiting for that opportunity to come boiling over like a pot on the top of a stove. You ever had one of those boiling pots in the steam there and then you add a little macaroni to it and a little bit and it goes shh. And as it cooks out, it goes and begins to expand. Overflow when it comes. And well, this is what happens with your mouth. You see, Isaiah says if your mouth speaks evil, then you're not at peace with God. If, if your mouth is speaking that which is evil, if what is coming out of you is not right, then the Bible says, Isaiah says, you've got a peace issue. You're trying to be something that you're not. He goes on and he says, who can live at peace in the presence of God? Well, it says, who reject the gain from extortion and keep their hands from accepting bribes? Those that do no evil. Those that honestly do no evil. And again, when Isaiah wants to ask you, ask you the question, are your actions evil? I love where he starts because he just says, show me the money. Look at how you're earning your money and look at how you're using your resources. And if those things aren't lining up with living in a godly relationship, then maybe you should start thinking about, am I doing evil? Yesterday, uh, we did a car wash. And I found this extremely funny. Um, it was a truly free car wash. We stood out there with great big signs that said free. And every car that pulled in this parking lot, you know what the first question they asked was? How much? I mean, they assumed there had to be some kind of a catch. I mean, no crazy person would be out there in the heat of the day washing cars charging nothing. And even some people were so insistent after you washed their car, they wanted to give you something because they didn't want to be obligated because they understood that, that you had given them a gift and we don't understand the concept of free, but you do understand that God wants us to do things freely. He wants us to give of our time and our resources and our energy, not because we are obligated to do so, but because, guess what? They're signs of who my relationship is. They're signs that I'm living in peace with God because, you know what? Truth comes, truth comes around. Everything I own belongs to God. Everything I have is His. So don't just focus on the money. He's really focused. Now, I 
want you to do notes on that will see what you hear isn't good for a lot of things. You don't want to try to check out whether or not you hit your outfit messages because that can be very complicated. That little two inch mirror is kind of if you hold it up in front of your face, this is that you see. Okay. See, what people yeah, you have to remember, I don't ever want to look at the two inch mirror because it gives you that only little circle view of who you are. And that's what we're talking about here. Take the small view of who you are and ask yourself, are my actions ones that are bringing me toward God or away from God? So, who can live in the peace and the presence of God? Those that hear no evil. This is what it says. Who stop their ears up against plots of murder. And I read this and you know what I think about? One of those kids, when they're tired of hearing you, they do this, la, 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 la. They put their fingers in, they try to make as much noise as possible because I don't want to hear it anymore. And then I have a question for you. A tree falls in the woods and there's nobody around to hear it. Does it make a noise? Now, before we start having that debate, you can't actually ask the question, answer the question, because if you answer the question, that means you'd have to be there from when the tree fell. And if you're there, then somebody there is to hear it. So around and around and around it goes can't answer this question, but you can't answer the question about this. If people that speak evil had nobody to listen to, then their voices would eventually just stop. Isn't this what we try to teach our kids? Just ignore when they're saying something. Okay, if your brother said something to the ear, don't hit him, although you might be tempted. Just ignore it. Let it go. But you know what? It comes to a point that when you just keep hearing evil, you just keep listening, and it begins to impact your life. You get to the point that all you ever hear is evil. All you ever hear is negative. All you ever hear are the problems in the world. And at that point, I start focusing like the big green balloons we had here last week. We start focusing on the problems and we forget the fact that, you know what? We're living in a relationship with God. My... Hear no evil is not that I'm never supposed to hear anything that's bad. My hear no evil is I'm supposed to be living close to God, that when I hear it, I know what to do with it. See, the issue isn't the fact that there's evil out there to hear. The issue is that we're so busy listening to the evil that we get to the God. We want to section it off and do the things the way that we want to do them. Who can live in peace in the presence of God? Well, you know the last one, right? Those that see no evil. I mean, this is what he says, and they shut their eyes against contemplating evil. Now, we have to be careful about how we apply this. But if I shut my eyes against it, that does not mean he chooses to be careful. But he chooses not to see the contemplating evil. In other words, there isn't a witch behind it. Everything out there is not intended for evil. But we need to be willing to shut our eyes to the fact that, you know what? People are people. I mean, even the monkeys in the coconut trees are seeing that people are people. You're going to walk out of this building today and you're going to walk back into a world that a great many people didn't spend a couple of hours in the church this morning listening to a sermon. You're going to go out into a world where there are different religions and different things that go on and different views of life. And they're going to walk into a world when people have both different lifestyles these days. And we look at this and we just want to shut our eyes to it all. But that's not what Isaiah is saying. He's not sh- saying shut your eyes and ignore it. He's saying see it for what it is. See it, but don't allow it to impact your life in such a way that you chase it. You see, that's the issue. We begin to see it and the idea that our eyes are not the window to our soul, they are the input funnel. We just keep consuming and keep consuming and keep consuming and keep consuming. And then we get to the point, and honestly, I'm all the way back at Isaiah chapter 5. I can't tell what's evil and what's good anymore. I get all the way to the point that, that I don't really understand the difference anymore. I mean, the world says it's okay, so can I just do it? Well, the problem is we come back to the question. I'm not asking you if you have a relationship. I'm asking, in your current way of living, are you at peace? Do you look for the loopholes and the ways that you think God isn't going to catch 
Isaiah says this, They are the ones who dwell on the heights, whose refuge will be the mountain fortress. Their bread will be supplied, and water will not fall, and water will not fail them. He gives us three things that we can kind of tell us if we're actually living in the presence of God. Now, I like that word, dwell, because dwell does not mean come. Okay? I do not dwell in this building. Okay, I spend a lot of hours in this building. But if you ask the mail comes to my house, this is not where I live. I have a house down in Wayfair, and that is where we dwell. That's why I most of my house. So understand, the idea is not, am I a good Christian here? Are you dwelling with God out there? When you leave here on Sunday morning, does God go back in the pew rack next to the Bible in the hymnal? Or is it a little pew in the and it's so good to go all over the place? And everywhere you go, it's just here. Everywhere you go, it's part of it. Because that's what Isaiah said. If you actually can live in his, if you're expecting to live in his presence in the future, you better learn how to live in his presence today. Are you protected by God? think about this. I don't mean that you can step out in front of a bus and the bus run over you and you don't die. I'm not talking about you're a superhero you can jump off a building and hit the concrete. I'm not talking about that kind of protection. But do you see God's plan and what your plan is? Or is your plan kind of out there and God is pitching? Do you see God walking through your life and just sometimes some things happen. Matt was sharing a story about, about a tornado that came through and the fact that, that he, they were out when the tornado came through. And it was a good thing because had they been with, at their hotel, there was a tree branch, a big tree branch that where the truck was going to It's like God told him to go out in the middle of the tornado and just check the truck. I don't know. But can you look back to the life and see where God is acting in your life? Is he guiding your life? Because if you can't, if it just seems like you're always wandering, you know what? Perhaps you're just trying to keep yourself. Maybe your relationship isn't what you think it is. Are you supplied by God? It says that they'll have their bread and their water. Now keep in mind, that's just the basics. I'm not asking you if you have the nicest house on the block. I'm asking you, does God fill you? I mean, or is it just one of those things that you just do? Does God actually fill your life? Does he supply your life? You see, are you doing, listening, watching, saying the 